retaliation and recriminations. Israel has ramped up its strikes on Hezbollah, killing civilians in Lebanon. A move that the group says won't go unpunished. Combined with the war on Gaza, could this exchange escalate into a regional conflict? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. The Israeli military has been exchanging fire with the Lebanese group Hezbollah almost daily since October 7th. Hezbollah says that it's in solidarity with its ally in Gaza, Hamas, and that it will continue as long as Israel bombards the Strip. At least 200 fighters and 13 soldiers have been killed, but this week Israeli strikes killed 10 civilians, including children, in southern Lebanon. Hezbollah has promised to retaliate, and Lebanon submitted a complaint to the UN Security Council. Both sides say they're not looking for all-out war, but increasingly attacks are happening far beyond the border area. So what does each party want to achieve, and how likely is a regional conflict? We'll explore all of this with our guests in just a moment. But first, this report by Malachabe Mutsepe. <laughs> Since Israel launched its war on Gaza four months ago, the army's exchanges with resistance movements in the region have escalated. The conflict between the Israeli military and Hezbollah at the Lebanon border has fled as the group pledged solidarity with Hamas against Israeli aggression. There have been near-daily exchanges of fire since October the 7th. Wednesday was the most volatile. Three Hezbollah fighters and at least 10 civilians were killed in southern Lebanon. The group's leader promised Israel would pay. We are fighting in southern Lebanon with our eyes on Gaza. When the aggression stops against Gaza and when the shooting stops in Gaza, we will stop the shooting in the south. The next day, Hezbollah fired rockets towards northern Israel. However, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant says the country is not looking for full-scale conflict. The planes that are flying in Lebanon's sky as we speak have targets, and they know to attack them and how to change their attack from one place to another. We could do a copy-paste from Gaza to Beirut, but we don't want to go there. Israel would pay a heavy price, and it would be catastrophic to Lebanon and Hezbollah. The tit-for-tat attacks have displaced at least 85,000 people on both sides of the border. Those left behind say they live in constant fear of airstrikes. Every day, the Israelis prove they cannot be trusted and that no one is safe near them. They are targeting civilians. To them, there is no difference between military personnel, children and adults. We heard a loud explosion but didn't know exactly what happened. I thought maybe rockets were launched from here, but then when the ambulances started arriving, we knew there had been a strike. The Israeli military has been accused of using white phosphorus as a weapon, an act that's classified as a war crime. It has also stepped up attacks on Hezbollah operation sites and carried out targeted killings of Hezbollah and Hamas leaders far from the battlefield, raising fears that the war on Gaza and battles on the Lebanon border will lead to larger regional conflict. Malikhabe Mozebe Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests. For today's discussion from London, we're joined by Gilbert Ashkar, who's a professor of development studies and international relations at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. From Beirut, we're joined by Hala Jaba, an award winning journalist and author of Hezbollah, Born with a Vengeance. And from Brussels, we're joined by Elijah Magnier who's a military and security analyst who's covered conflicts in the Middle East, including Lebanon, for more than 35 years. A warm welcome to you all. Elijah, let's start with you. Just how dangerous a moment is this for the region? Despite all parties saying uh, that they don't want one, could we see Israel and Hezbollah at war again? It is extremely dangerous because the Middle East is dealing with the Israeli prime minister, who is holding to his seat, wants to remain in power, and is determined, even at the cost of burning all of Gaza, Lebanon, uh, attack Iraq, Syria, whatever keeps him at war to justify his presence and to dismiss an early election in Israel, he's going to enlarge the war as long as he can 
and as much as he can. And this is why he is breaking the rules of engagement in Lebanon, and he is trying to provoke Hezbollah into a larger conflict, knowing that Hezbollah wants to establish deterrence. And he is still, yet despite all his attempt to commit all these bombardments and commit crimes against civilians, he is insisting in continuing the bombardment on Lebanon, and above all, insisting in the war on Gaza that is the key of the solution and the trouble of everything in the Middle East today. Hala, do you agree that this is a particularly dangerous moment for the region? How likely is it that it could escalate? Yes, absolutely. I think we are now at a junction where we, we refer to it or we see it as a tipping point, because that's where we are. We are at a tipping point. If you had asked us this a month ago, two months ago, it wasn't as bad as it is now. Uh, both sides, we know, uh, in theory, do not want this war. Both sides do not want to wage large-scale war on each other. Um, both sides, however, have red lines, um, be it Hezbollah or Israel. And um, the escalations in the last, uh, the escalation, especially um, from Israel in the last week, is quite uh, cons uh, considerable. And it begs the question as to what they want to achieve from this. Do they want, they're forcing or they're trying to force Hezbollah into a large scale war? However, Hezbollah is playing it um, wiser, if you want. And if we look at both sides, we see that Hezbollah continues to target military um, uh, installations or military targets, whereas in the case of Israel, Israel is actually um, uh, provoking Hezbollah by targeting civilian uh, targets, uh, like we've seen in the last few days. There were uh, mothers and children and families that were actually killed. So um, even though they, uh, they, they, he doesn't want a war, but like Elijah said, um, it is in Netanyahu's interest at the moment to continue in a state of war, because as long as he is, um, he will not be ousted and he will not be facing the criminal uh, charges that he has to face later. So he wants to stay on the seat. But like Elijah also said, this is at the risk of burning this region and 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 um, blowing it out, maybe out of control by 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 triggering a regional war. Gilbert Ashkar, professor, as you heard there, uh, both sides insist that they don't want a war. Hezbollah, however, has vowed to retaliate for Wednesday's strikes this week. Is there a danger that the situation could accidentally escalate? I think it would be difficult to, to uh, speak of accidents, uh, given the, the uh, extreme state of uh, preparation and awareness of both sides. And uh, they have both uh, all means of self-control. Uh, there are some groups other than Hezbollah who operates from uh, southern Lebanon, <clears throat> some Palestinian groups, including, including Hamas itself. But uh, they are also under control by Hezbollah. So I don't think that uh, any, I mean, any escalation would be just a matter of accident. Uh, if, if it happens, it would be something, I would say, uh, quite deliberate. And on the Israeli side, not on the Hezbollah side. I, I'm, I mean, when you say both sides don't war, I uh, don't want to, uh, to, I mean, to enlarge the war, uh, I don't think this is uh, um, equal for both sides. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Hezbollah does not want to, to get into a large-scale war. Otherwise, they would have done that from uh, the beginning in October and uh, at a moment when, uh, you know, uh, the forces of Hamas were still uh, uh, intact and uh, that could have been a joint war of both Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, which uh, was what Hamas actually wished for at, uh, at that moment. But uh, 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 Lebanon, after the experience of 2006, I mean, Hezbollah is, is quite um, wary of, of a, a new episode of destruction in the country. Lebanon has today become, uh, you know, it's uh, on the, the verge of the abyss. Uh, it's an abysmal uh, condition economically. And that's why, from the Lebanese side, Hezbollah doesn't have an, uh, any incentive in, in enlarging the war. I can't say the same of, of, uh, of Israel. Israel has been for, for quite long uh, uh, explaining that the day will come when they will have to settle account with Hezbollah. They can't tolerate uh, what they regard as some kind of advanced post position of Iran uh, on their northern border. That's how they look at Hezbollah. And, uh, and uh, 
you know, uh, last August, so before Gaza, before October 7th, last August, the, the present uh, Ministry of, Def of Defense, or so-called Defense of Israel, you have Galant, uh, men uh, threatened to, to turn Lebanon into the back to the Stone Age uh, uh, when he was visiting the, the, the border area and saw some positions of Hezbollah across the border. Elijah, picking up on, on what you were saying a few moments ago about uh, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu, is perhaps a, a conflict uh, in the north of, of Israel uh, and the south of, of Lebanon, or with Lebanon as, as a whole, uh, perhaps part of a, of a strategy surrounding exiting Gaza? The main line for Hezbollah, for Iraq and for Yemen is to make sure that the attention of the world is not diverted away of the Palestinian cause and not shifting from uh, the, uh, the not shifting the attention from what's happening in Gaza and all the crimes against humanity and war crimes and intent of genocide against the Palestinian people. That is a red line. Now, apart from that, the people in the south of Lebanon have accepted to engage in this war where Hezbollah doesn't have really limits of sacrifices because, first, if uh, Israel is not stopped, then the next battle is on Lebanon. Secondly, there is a link between the Palestinians and the Lebanese. Both are fighting a just cause against injustice because there are also territories in Lebanon that are occupied by the Israelis. For that, Hezbollah is ready to intensify the bombardment equally or a bit less because we're talking about a non-state actor versus a classical army that is considered one of the strongest in the Middle East. Well, that was the narrative before the 7th of October, but the Palestinian resistance obviously has broke this myth. And uh, because of that, Israel has the power of destruction. But again, Hezbollah also has a power of destruction and hasn't used all its weapons yet. So at the moment, there is a containment, even if there are some violation from time to time. But what's going to happen next in Rafa? Are the Palestinians going to be pushed for another exodus? This is where the tension will raise again on the borders with Lebanon, in Yemen, and in Iraq, where they will contribute to hit Israel because the Palestinians will not be left alone. Uh, all right, L L um, Hala, I'll come to you in just a moment, but I just want to bring Gilbert in just, just for a moment. I, I didn't articulate the question particularly well when I put it to Elijah, but do you think that a conflict in, in the north of Israel, in, in southern Lebanon, could be part of an Israeli strategy uh, surrounding exiting Gaza somehow? Uh, well, the, the, the link is in the, in the fact that uh, Israel uh, uh, wanted to avoid uh, conducting the war on both fronts. I mean, <clears throat> the, the intensity of destruction in, in Gaza is, is unprecedented, as everyone uh, now acknowledges. And that would, have, would not have been possible without direct U.S. involvement. This is the first joint U.S.-Israeli war. In fact, the first war which uh, the United States completely uh, 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 takes part in, uh, approves the, its goals, uh, uh, and organize an air bridge, without which uh, Israel would not have been able to do that. But now, I mean, they so they were uh, busy uh, destroying Gaza, which they set the, the, the end of the year, 23, uh, as a deadline for the intensive, uh, most intensive phase of bombing. And as soon as that ended, so from the 2nd of January, they started the escalation uh, on the Lebanese side with the assassination of uh, Saleh al-Aruri, al who is, of course, a Hamas figure, but who, who lived in the, in the midst of the areas controlled by Hezbollah uh, uh, in Lebanon. And we had a series of such escalation uh, uh, starting from, from that point. So very clearly, from the beginning of that year, uh, uh, Israel considered that since the intensive bombing of Gaza uh, is over as a phase, and they moved to, to what they call lower <clears throat> intensity war there, they, they, they can threaten Lebanon with, a, uh, with repeating what they did in Gaza. That's exactly what they are doing every day.
they are uh, threatening of turning Lebanon into rubbles, as they did in Gaza. Okay, Hala, do you want to come back on that before I put a, a, a direct question to you? Yes, I think they are intensifying across the border with Lebanon. However, I don't think yet they've started to intensify to the point of um, reducing the trouble like they've done in Gaza. Um, can they do that in the future? Yes, absolutely. They have the power with the, you know, they, they, they have they, um, they, they have the war planes where Lebanon doesn't have that, be it Lebanon as in the Lebanese army or Hezbollah as in the resistance Hezbollah, um, um, the non-state actor or the mini army. So they can inflict damage um, with that. Um, yes, Lebanon would prefer not to go through that, not to see it damaged, not to see it destroyed like 2006. If, if Shaf comes to push, they will. And the fact of the matter is that uh, for the Lebanese, for many Lebanese, as much as they would hate that, and they're not looking forward to that, they've been there, done that, got t-shirts for it, sorry to be so crass about it. Whereas in Israel, Israel has never been through um, a huge bombardment, and they will get that from Hezbollah. Hezbollah is able to reach um, quite deep into Israel. It has never used it yet because it's always trying to be restrained. But if, if, if need be, if, if, um, if um, Israel decides to turn as, you know, quote unquote, the rhetoric that they use into, you know, the, the, the Stone Age, well, yes, Lebanon can also, or Hezbollah can also inflict massive damages across Israel, across cities that have never seen war in their life, and they will be hugely impacted by it. So, um, I think I think Israel's uh, Israel's intent is always to come back to to Lebanon and Hezbollah and finalize, or they think they will finalize. That's the last war. But I don't think they're ready. When I say ready, I don't think they want to do it at the same time as uh, uh, the war in Gaza is going. So I think that this escalation, it's um, it's still within a certain geography. It's still within certain rules of of engagement that both seem to understand. Both will incur certain losses. They're allowing for these losses, um, but they don't want to go beyond for the time being. That's not to say that they wouldn't go beyond later. At, at Hala, Lebanon is not Hezbollah. Hezbollah is not Lebanon. Uh, what are the dangers for Hezbollah here in terms of public opinion in uh, Lebanon if the country is somehow dragged into, into a conflict with, with Israel again and targets uh, in, in Beirut, for example, are, are being hit? Uh, well, we are expecting this time from, again, from the rhetoric that they said at the beginning, that this is what they would do. And they use that rhetoric in order to pressure the Lebanese government to stand against or for the population to split. Look, it's no secret in Lebanon, you know, there are two sides to this equation. There's one side that's totally um, in, in, uh, rejects um, rejects this, uh, even, even what's going on now, rejects the idea that Lebanon should be dragged into this war or that Hezbollah, for that matter, is fighting to support uh, the, the Palestinians. But then you have another sector, which is a huge sector, which are, you know, and we're not just talking about Shiite Lebanese or, or those from the South, we, that also in, include a, a large sector from the, from, uh, from the North and from, uh, and from the East and from the, uh, from the Christian um, uh, side that are, if you want, allies or in alliance, and they accept that this might happen and that they will take the brunt of it. Now, Beirut, yes, Beirut will be, that's what they've said, that they will attack Beirut. Um, I think Sayyid Nasrallah, I think um, he responded to that a few days ago when he had, when he made that last statement, and he said, you know, if, if, they were pushed into such a war where he has to go into war, then all, all, um, you know, all, all these rules, all these pressures will have to be set aside and he will go into this war without actually, um, not without considering anything, but he will do it because he thinks it's the right thing. Um, okay. Lebanon usually in these, in these places always sort of, um, once the war starts, you would rally, you put your differences aside and you rally around your 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 other uh, uh, you know the people that are being uh, hit or or where the war is, and they will discuss the political disagreements later. Um, if the war is launched on Lebanon, it's not like any anyone can stop uh, what's coming, and no one can stop the fact that Lebanon, as in Hezbollah, will have to defend. Uh, yes, you say uh, Hezbollah is not Lebanon, Lebanon is not Hezbollah, no, but there's a large sector of Lebanon that is Hezbollah and the large sector of Hezbollah that is Lebanon. So, and it is a non-state um, actor in Lebanon, but that's also, we need to be very clear, it's because the Lebanese army has never, ever been allowed to be weaponized as well as Israel in order to defend the country. And this is not in uh, no disrespect to the Lebanese army, but the fact of the matter remains that the United States and these big powers have refused, rejected, and blocked any attempt to um, arm the Lebanese army to such a point where it can actually take on Israel if need be. This has not happened, so 
the resistance such as Hezbollah and others have, have, um, have were born into this, and um, it's become their job to do that. Hello, uh, uh, we, let's move on. Elijah, um, do Israel's ongoing strikes in southern Lebanon amount to war crimes? Of course it is, because it's an attack against civilians, particularly when uh, uh, Israel attacked the, the last time in Nabati, just a couple of days ago. This is a direct attack against civilians, and it's a uh, sheer provocation to Hezbollah to enlarge the battle. And Hezbollah is extremely sensitive to the assassination or the killing or the target killing of civilians, because the Israelis send a special drone with high explosive to target a particular apartment with a family. That is a crime against humanity because it is targeting civilians. Also, Israel has been indiscriminately destroying many houses in the south of Lebanon, burning the uh, uh, valley of Saluki. All that amounts to a crime that Israel is uh, accustomed to. This is not something new when you see what they are doing in Gaza and what they have done in the last five wars on Gaza and the 2006 in Lebanon. Because they are unaccountable, they can do that. And I would like to add one other point. The dangerous part is there are many troops on the Lebanese borders, and there are, uh, the Israelis are gathering more forces. If Hezbollah responds harshly, as rightly it has the right to retaliate to the Israelis, because they are bombarding, because they are targeting the civilians, what happens if the Israelis lose 20 to 30 soldiers with one of the big rocket of Hezbollah? This is where things that are not calculated can spill over to a larger war. So we're walking really on the edge of the abyss with the determination of Netanyahu to remain in power and provoking further Hezbollah by saying, well, now I start killing the civilians. Now in Nabatiye, as you rightly also suggested, it could go to Beirut, and this is where the war can be enlarged. Gilbert, there's a UN peacekeeping force on the ground in southern Lebanon. What's it doing at this time of heightened tension? I mean, if it, it can't keep the peace, what, what is its role there? Well, they are uh, uh, powerless, I mean, in the face of what is happening. They are just uh, watching and reporting. Uh, this is not uh, a force that has been able to, 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 to take action uh, for long. And uh, precisely one of the issues that are uh, on the table now in the negotiations uh, led by uh, Washington on the one hand and Paris on the other uh, in, with regard to Lebanon, uh, the, one of the questions is the, the future of, of this uh, UN force and especially uh, a deployment of the Lebanese army, which they would uh, regard as uh, 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 more important than, than just the, the keeping this uh, UN force uh, doing the job. And Security Council Resolution 1701, uh, what does all of this mean for that? Well, that's, uh, that's the resolution that was adopted uh, in the wake of the uh, 2006 uh, Israeli war on Lebanon and on Hezbollah. And uh, that uh, included uh, a withdrawal of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Hezbollah forces uh, north of the Litani River, which is uh, something like uh, uh, 25, 30 kilometers from uh, north of, uh, of the border. And uh, the deployment of the Lebanese army and the uh, United Nations forces uh, in, in, that, uh, in that area. But uh, since then, this, uh, this agreement has uh, a kind of uh, um, lost its, uh, its uh, reality. Mm. And uh, uh, Israel, on the one side, has been uh, uh, systematically violating uh, this agreement by violating, uh, for instance, the Lebanese airspace and uh, and uh, taking every kind of actions. And uh, therefore, uh, Hezbollah forces have uh, gone back and redeployed uh, in the area. And that has led to this uh, escalation between uh, between the two sides. As, as, as I mentioned, uh, the Israeli uh, defense uh, minister last August uh, visiting 
the border had uh, uh, made the threat that I mentioned. Uh, these threats are being made, but we know that Israel now is also preparing militarily. They are taking uh, every kind of measures uh, for a possible action on Lebanon. I think the key point that uh, uh, is now uh, holding them back is uh, the, the fact that um, uh, with the uh, increasing pressure that you have internationally, especially on the issue of Rafah, the invasion the, of, uh, of Rafah that uh, Israel is uh, poised to, 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 to do, uh, that wouldn't be the moment for Israel, you know, to, to engage into another war that wouldn't have the approval of, uh, of at least Washington. So that's the key point here. And uh, we, I mean, there have been talks about Netanyahu, but I think Netanyahu and the whole far right in Israel are very much betting on uh, a comeback of uh, Donald Trump to the presidency of the United States. And that would create for them the ideal condition they would believe into in engaging into a much larger war that would, in, in, I mean, including striking at Iran most probably. I'm, so, I'm sorry, we're very tight for time. Um, Elijah, I want to put one more question to you. What would be uh, um, uh, the implications of an escalation for the wider region then? You mentioned Iran and other, other earlier. Would other parties be, be drawn in? If so, who, how protect, protracted or otherwise would, would a, uh, an escalation be? Who would win? Uh, the resistance always wins, and the occupier is always defeated. However, there are damages in every war. Now we're coming to a very critical situation where Hezbollah needs to retaliate against the killing of the civilian in Nabatigi, and that can escalate. And certainly Hezbollah would not be left alone, where, again, the Mediterranean can be blocked, Iran can join in, Iraq can join in, and Yemen. Who's going to win, first of all, are the Palestinian people who brought back the, the cause on the world table. Second, the Israel is losing. The ICJ is on Monday, and Israel crime are no longer hidden on anyone. Third, the resistance will always confirm that we will not bow to the Israelis and to all the supporters, even if they are supported by a superpower like the United States and all the spineless European community that is not taking any measure against Israel. So at the end of the day, yes, civilians are paying the price, but the cause is much bigger. The cause of Palestine is bigger than Gaza, is bigger than Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, and Iran. And there we must end it. Many thanks indeed to you all, Elijah Manier, Hala Jabba, and uh, Gilbert Ashkar. Uh, as always, thank you for watching. You can see the program again at any time by going to the website, which is at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you're welcome to join us on our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on X. Our handle there at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha, I'll see you again. Bye for now.